Now before we start looking at continuous distributions, let's just recap what we should already know about discrete distributions. So probability distributions, remember we define a random variable when we're doing our statistics. It's quantity depends upon the chance of it happening. And then the probability distribution then lists all the possible values of that random variable and their probabilities. Let's use this as an example. We've got eggs in a supermarket, they're sold in boxes of six. So my random variable I'm going to define to be uh, the number of broken eggs in a box. And hopefully that number will be zero because you, you know, you'd you like them all to be fine. Here's the probability distribution. So the number of broken eggs, well, there's no chance six or five. One would hope that they'd pick that up before they're putting it out there. But there's a very small probability that four of them might be broken down to a, a larger probability that actually, no, they, they are all good and hopefully that's the box you pick up and, and buy. That is, of course, our probability distribution. Okay. Properties of this probability of the random variable equaling x. Remember, it's going to be a positive number because we're talking about probability and all of them have to add up to be one because you've got to cover every possibility. If it turns out that the probability is the same for everything, then we have what's called a uniform distribution. So x is the discrete random variable, the expected value we saw is the sum of x px. px is that probability of it happening. Now expected value as it turns out is the same as average or mean. And it is, of course, a measure of central tendency, roughly where the middle of the data is. So, all right, we're going to buy 10 boxes. Now, how many eggs would you expect to be broken? Okay, if we're going to buy 10 boxes. So we now add that extra row, the XPX row, so we can work out the expected value. It sums to be 0.3. 0.3 eggs are going to be broken in every box, that's what we're expecting. Now, of course, you can't have 0.3 of an egg being broken, but if we're buying 10 boxes then, if 0.3 in every box is broken, then overall we'd expect to have three broken eggs. 10 boxes, 0.3 in each. Then there was this idea of variance. And, well, we created this formula, but we ended up, this is probably the easiest way of doing it, the expected value of x squared <coughs> minus that average squared, or the expected value of x squared, however you want to think about it. The expected value of x squared is the sum of x squared px. And mu is, of course, our expected value. It's a measure of spread, how spread out the data is. Standard deviation, then, we use to bring the units right because x squared is, would have units squared. But if we look talking about units, we need to bring it back to units, not units squared. So we find the, the square root of the variance to get standard deviation. Or another way of saying that is sigma squared is the variance. And that's why we often use the symbol sigma squared to represent variance. All right, let's go back to our eggs. What is the standard deviation? Now add that third row in, the x squared px row. So the expected value of x squared minus the average squared. So 0.6 is our expected value of x squared, and then the average was 0.3, so square that. 0.51 is the variance, therefore the deviation well, to three decimal places, 0.714. Relative frequencies. So relative frequencies we use when we're just sampling, uh, and it gives us an estimate of the theoretical. If we were to grab every possibility, an infinite number of possibilities, then we would have the theoretical probabilities. But when we're actually collecting data, it doesn't work as nice and neatly. But what happens is as that sample size increases, then these relative frequencies, these estimates, will get closer and closer to the actual theoretical probability itself. Students in year 12, I have them before me, we're surveyed to find out the number of siblings students have. And we've placed it in our relative frequency distribution table. So rather than now a probability distribution, it's a relative frequency distribution. Construct a relative frequency histogram and polygon for the data. There is our histogram, which of course is like the column graph. The polygon, you'll recall, we join up to the center of the top of the column. But then we add in the one before and the one after, which of course has zero frequency, hence why we plot it to the axis. Join them up, and there is our polygon. Calculate the area of those rectangles. All have a width of one, 
So that would be the probability of each of those added together. So of course it equals 1. It's the sum of the probabilities essentially. No, it's got to be 1. Calculate the area under the polygon. Well, I'm going to use the trapezoidal rule to do it. Now, the reason I'm using the trapezoidal rule, I've got these lovely straight lines. So it'll work very nicely. So using our trapezoidal rule, we get a half of all of this. And it equals 1, the sum of all the probabilities. This explains why we join up to the next one at 0. It's that little extra bit of area when you join it up which now gets the probabilities summing to be one under not only the histogram, but the polygon as well. So way back in, when did you first look at stats? Year seven, year eight. And you thought, why on earth are we joining these up to the axes? This is why. Because we want the area under that, for want of a better word, curve. I mean, it's a lot of straight lines. But we want that area to equal one. We want it to be all of the probabilities together. See, there's a direct relationship between that area under both the polygon and the histogram and the probability itself. And this is this connection between statistics and probability. It is all one topic. Construct a cumulative relative frequency histogram. Woohoo, that's a mouthful. And OGIVE for the data. Well, there's the cumulative relative frequency histogram. OGIVE. Well, that's a fancy name for the polygon. Now, I remember when you're doing this one, the polygon, you start at the bottom left uh, of the rectangle here, and you just go the diagonals whoop, and to the right top, and that creates our curve. Calculate then the five number summary and the interquartile range. Okay, so there's our cumulative frequency, anyway, all those words. The minimum is zero, we can clearly see that. Q1 we will need. Well, Q1 is 25%, and that's where the OGIVE becomes useful. So at 25%, we go across, we hit the OGIVE, we're in column one. So Q1 must have been one. The median, or Q2, would be 50%. It also ended up in one. Q3 is 75%. It's ended up in the column two. And the maximum is six. So the five number summary is 0, 1, 1, 2, 6. I mean, if you were to draw a box and whisker, that's another way of demonstrating those five numbers. But the interquartile range would be Q3 minus Q1, which in this case is 1. And that'll do us. So there's a little recap of discrete distribution.